Cool is out here making moves and creating features we can all use to make our 360 tours look and function better. A basic online editor, and it's full of cool features I literally use on every job I upload. And in this video, I'm gonna go over all those features and the settings I personally use. This isn't gonna be a long video, but it will be information dense. What's the deal, everyone? Welcome to the office, since you've not seen it in a while. I'm Jeremy Deal, and if you're new here, I talk about being a full-time creative with a focus on running a real estate visuals marketing company and the gear it takes to do that. And a big shout out to Kula for sponsoring this video. I would say more about them later on, but really we'll be covering their awesome tour platform this entire video. I'll be switching between the a7 IV and the 360 link camera I keep attached to my editing rig behind me. All right, here we are on the computer and we're only gonna do a single image upload because we're talking about all the cool tools and features on the side. If you're interested in a more full breakdown version, you know, you'll be able to see that video next in the series. It'll be the last video we're doing for Kula during this series. Boom, it is now edited up. Now, I'm not gonna go in order over here. I'm gonna go in what I think is the most important and then I'll come back to the little special features after. First thing we're gonna talk about is heading because this is the most important feature in my opinion when you're building these tours. This is the direction they will see when they first log into this image. Now this image is a tricky one because I took it to showcase this area right here, the nice little octagonal sitting dining area. But this view is also kind of cool. In case you were curious, the two most popular cameras on the platform are the One RS 1 inch 360 edition and the X3. Both cameras I've created a lot of videos about for my channel and both Insta360. In this video, I'll be using images captured by the One RS 1 inch 360 edition, but the workflow will be the same and the knowledge will be applicable to any camera you might be using, no matter if it's Insta360 brand, Ricoh, or you know any other 360 brand camera out there. Just something to think about, I'm gonna start off and this is the view, this is the room that I took this picture for. So this is the shot I'm gonna go for and I'm gonna show you how moving this heading really matters. Now, you can either click it and drag it or you can use numbers over here if you'd prefer to move it that way. I prefer to click and drag. Now this part can be a little difficult because when you're messing with Cool, you have to remember that the center isn't the center of your web browser, which would be here. It's the center of the frame. And since this is all over here on the left, you can't close it out because it'll cancel. You see that? So you have to actually figure out what the center of this of your actual picture is and not your whole web display. I hope that makes sense. Now let's continue. I'd say this is about it. Now one thing to always keep in mind is over here on your heading, see how it's negative one? That's up and down, that's your Y axis. I always go and change this to a zero because I want them to load into the image at a nice parallel, even perspective. Now. After heading, we're gonna come right underneath it to the thumbnail because this will be the tiny thumbnail that they see before they click on the image if they're not using the hotspots. If you have the little preview trail down at the bottom, this is what they're gonna see. And right now, as you can see, that's what they're gonna see. And that's not what I want them to see. So you reframe your picture however you want to be able to see it. And it usually does a square of about this side. And you'll see, you'll take a snapshot Boom, it's a little too far over, so we'll move it again, take another snapshot, and there we go. I still don't like that as much. Let's try that. There we go, that's a little better. It shows the majority of the windows. And now, since we've done the snapshot, that will be the view they see at the preview at the bottom if they wanna choose this image. Now we're gonna scroll down again because the next thing I wanna talk about is right down here, these zoom settings. Now, typically it comes in at zero, which means it makes sure it's set to a way where all the verticals are as correct as possible. Now, me personally, when people are looking through these 360 tours, I believe they're trying to see how large and connected the spaces are. So I actually like to zoom out a little bit. Zoom settings are kind of backwards. Left is zoom in and right is zoom out. So just think about that. And I usually put this around 20. That's where I like it. Now, this is the difference between zero, which is in a little bit more, and 20, which is right here. It shows a little bit more of the window. It just makes it feel a little bit larger. So the zoom settings are done. Let's move on to the next thing that I think is very important, and that's right underneath it, the pitch limit. Now, let me kind of describe what this does for you. Right now, there is no pitch limit, or it's set to 90 degrees, which means I can, look str I can look everywhere around. 
This can be very confusing to people who have never used a 360 tour before. So it depends on if I'm shooting a one story or a two story house and which rooms I'm shooting. I don't want them to be able to look all around and confuse themselves and disorient themselves. That's the last thing you want. So I'm actually gonna come over here and set my pitch level to somewhere around, here we go, 20 is usually, again, that magic number. See, now I cannot scroll up or down past 20 degrees. This is what I like the most for a one-story house or a room with no stairs because you don't need to go higher than this. You don't need to look directly up in a the picture. There's no way to lose orientation or feel confused for anyone if you set this pitch limit. Now, whenever I go into rooms that have stairs, for instance, I will set the pitch limit higher, closer to like 45, 50, because that allows them to look up the stairs from that one shot. But still, the rest of the house, whenever there's no stairs involved, this pitch limit for me is going right back down to 20%. Again, that just makes it easier for these new 360 tour users to experience any platform without getting any degree of like separation, confusion, and disorientation. We're trying to avoid that the most. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about that's right here is this level corrector. And typically I don't have this problem because I actually send a lot of my 360s out to be processed through my outsource editor. But if sometimes there are still little issues and that's where this comes in line, I love the fact that whenever, sorry, I grabbed the wrong one, the level corrector. I love the grid pattern that comes up whenever you're doing this. It's very, very helpful. And even sometimes I still use it. It's a very, very helpful setting. Now we're gonna go up a little bit and talk about some other things. First thing we're gonna talk about is the description here. It comes stock with whatever the name of the image is, but you're gonna to wanna to put whatever you want people to read or whatever you want them to see whenever they click on this image as the description. So you can call it the octagonal dining room or you can call it whatever you want because I'm pretty sure I just spelled that incorrectly. Either way, this is where you want to put the description and I think this is a really important thing to fill out for every image. Next thing we're going to talk about is right on top of that, these add-ons. I don't use them a lot, but I do use them sparingly. First thing we're going to talk about is image. Now for this one, I'm just going to bring in some random, here we go, from some other channel I work on. This allows you to bring in things like logos, or if maybe you wanted to put, you can put it on the floor, on the wall, you can make it 2D, you can scale it the further away it is. So there's all kinds of options you can do here. And this is really used like, let's say you wanted to put the logo on the TV for whoever you made this tour for, or maybe you wanted to hide something that they didn't want in the 360 tour. Like, ooh, I really hate that corner. Can we hide this with my logo? Boom. Do you have a picture of a fire you can put in the fireplace? Boom. There are so many ways you can use this image one in particular to enhance your tour. But I will say I very rarely use it. The reason I don't use it is because if you put branding in these tours, they cannot use it on the MLS because they can't have any branding, which I know is the dumbest thing ever. I still don't understand why the MLS operates that way because right next to the thing is their name, but they've already put it on there. I digress, it makes no sense. I rarely use this option and I even rarely or rarely -er, I don't think that's right. I almost never use it to put branding because I want agents to be able to use these anywhere, but I will use it to hide things if they ask like, hey, that corner looks disgusting. Can we just put a black wall there? Yes, you can do that easily. You can also do the same thing with text. So if we come here and do text, let's say that maybe they had, here we go, they've got a double oven or actually let's scroll over here to the cooktop. Let's pretend like this was a cooktop that had a pot filler, but it was hard to tell there was a pot filler on first glance. So you can put pot filler right there and you can label it in the tour. So it's very easy to notice. This is one that I do use more often than the image one. Oop, wrong button, sorry about that. This is something I use quite often compared to the image one, but just wanted to throw it out there so you know where it is and what it actually does. Now we're gonna come down here to the filters. I used to use them a lot more, but as I just mentioned, I am currently getting my 360 images processed off-site, so I don't have to worry about color contamination as much. 
But when I did have to worry about color contamination, one of these filters I would use quite often, and that's the grayscale filter. Now, obviously you don't want it at filter intensity 100%, but what I found is that if you bring this thing in at about 10, 11%, yes, it will mute the other colors in the room a little bit, but what it will also mute is that yellowish tinge that comes from incandescent lighting, and it helps a whole lot with that. This is the only filter I would ever use for my professional workflow, professional workflow, professional workflow. So whenever I'm delivering tours, this is the only one I would ever use Though I do think some of the other ones are kind of cool. The cooler one in particular I would use when people have yellow dining rooms. That yellow is so overpowering, you can knock it with the cooler filter just a little bit. Again, like filter 10, 20% max, and it'll just knock off a lot of that brightness from the yellow. The last one I like, uh, but I would not use in a professional work sense, is vintage. And that's just because I actually really like sepia tone stuff. I like vintage feels. So if I was doing something creative or fun and not professional and delivered to a client for a real estate world, then I would probably use the vintage filter on some stuff. But typically speaking, I go with none. Next thing we're gonna go down to is the HDR tone mapping because it's the next thing that I think is pretty cool if you're not using one of the Insta360 cameras in particular because they're really good with their own software and the way it produces those HDR images. But here we go, we've got the HDR tone mapping. Now what this is gonna do is drastically gonna decrease the amount of contrast and the separation from whites and blacks and it'll make sense when I pump it all the way up. See how the blacks aren't quite as black the whites aren't quite as white. They're removing a lot of that contrast to be able to remove darkness that can happen during the HDR process for these 360 photos since they're encompassing such large areas of space. Like, look, this is literally one, two, three, four, five, six different spaces in one single shot, theoretically, that this camera has to do. So this can come in handy, but I will be honest, I try and use it as little as possible because I prefer to keep darkness and shadows and blacks black in my images. That's just my style that I personally like. But if you need to see further, you need it to look a little lighter and brighter, use this tone mapping. Again, with all of these intensity filters, I never go to something like 100%. 50% and below is typically the most I would ever use any of these filters, but it's your image. You choose how much of these you want to use. Next one we're going to talk about is sharpness, and this is one that I basically never ever use because I don't like to add sharpness. I hate digital sharpness more than anything else. Like even if I grab this sharpness, look, 67%, that's insane. Even at 20%, it's so noticeable. I'm not really quite sure who the sharpness filter is for, but it's not for me in my workflow. Now we're gonna come down to all this photo information at the bottom. I'm not gonna go over every single one of these, but I will tell you that whenever I'm doing real estate work, I leave all of that off because I don't want someone's personal interior of their house information associated with their access that anyone can pull up. If I'm doing something more public, like maybe I'm working for a museum or a commercial building space where they want people to find this information outside of having to search for it, then this make location public and adding the location, make public data available, all of those I'll click on, but typically for real estate in particular, I leave all of that off because I don't necessarily want to put that information online for someone else. If the agent wants to do that later, that is their choice, but that's not my choice because I don't own the home. Sorry for that tangent. Let's go on to the next one. And this one, I honestly am going to say, I just noticed this feature. I don't know how long it's been on the platform, but I think it's pretty cool audio. It allows you to add audio to the tour. And I'm not talking about music. You obviously can add music to these things. This is way better than music. You can have your agents record audio to lay over their virtual tour as though they were giving a guided tour themselves. So they could talk about here in the entrance way and you're in the entrance way shot. And then they can say something like here in the living room and right in front of them is the hot spot to click on. They move into the living room and they're still listening to the audio of the agent talking about the room, so on and so forth. This audio can be used as a branded example from your agents speaking directly to the consumer. And that is the best way to get really good conversion because 
the people listening, they're listening to the agent. They're gonna have more than that three minutes of recollection time required to be able to reach out and start building that parasocial relationship that everyone has. The one that you probably have watching me do this is a parasocial relationship. You're trying to build that same relationship between the viewer and the agent presenting this house in a much shorter amount of time. So audio is a great way to do that. And it's been underutilized by me, probably underutilized by a lot of you, but this is a powerhouse feature if you're not using it yet. Everyone is sleeping on it. Don't be like me, use it more. All right, so I think we've done everything. All these other little things are add-ons, tiny planet. No one wants a tiny planet of the inside of the house, maybe of the exterior. I don't know what to tell you. I don't use any of those. That is all of the photo information and photo editing filters here on the side. And remember, if you really wanna see the full walkthrough of everything, from start to finish for the Cooler program, make sure to like and subscribe because my next video will be the third and final installment from this three-part series done by Kula about their program and real estate photography and imagery in general. This is once again gonna be a full deep dive from start to finish on how to use and produce with Kula from the second I bring home my camera to the moment I press publish. As always, keep rocking and rolling. Enjoy what you're doing. Come back next time for that last video and I will catch you next time. Ooh. It's not as impactful when I'm tiny on the side, is it? I don't think so. Okay.